Uh, good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of 2024 of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Our first item of business today is the decision to take items 5 and 6 in private. Are members content to do so? Thank you. Um, item 2 on the agenda is an evidence session on the Public Procurement International Trade Agreements, Miscellaneous Amendments, Scotland Regulations 2024. I welcome Ivan McKee, Minister for Public Finance, who is joined by Ross Grimley, Solicitor, and Ian Moore, Head of Procurement Policy, both the Scottish Government. Uh, I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning, Committee. Um, trade agreements uh, often include provisions for providing uh, for reciprocal access to public procurement. And while we know that trade is, of course, a reserved matter, the implementation is often in devolved areas uh, such as public procurement. Accordingly, Scottish procurement regulations say that bidders from countries with a, uh, a relevant uh, agreement applies are entitled to equal treatment for when bidding for specified contracts in Scotland. This instrument uh, updates a list of relevant agreements and inserts a reference to a new agreement between the UK and Kazakhstan and updates references to agreements with uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Kosovo, North Macedonia and Albania. Agreements with these countries originally reached by the EU and then rolled over by the UK included contracts for some healthcare services in their scope. While this did not compel public bodies to award contracts for these services rather than providing them in-house, it meant that if contracts for these services were ever being awarded, bidders from those countries would be entitled to equal treatment. Uh, these agreements have been renegotiated to remove the health care uh, services from their scope and this instrument ensures that the Scottish regulations will refer to these ref uh, refreshed agreements. The Scottish Government has consistently and successfully implemented international obligations on procurement since 2006 when it first transposed the EU procurement directorates, uh, directives and is consistent in its commitment to upholding international law. The amendments to trade agreements contained in this SSI are necessary in order to reflect changes to international obligations and there is no substantive discretion exercisable in their implementation. Thank you. Do you have any questions from members? Uh, Lorna Slater. Thank you. Just, uh, just so I can be understand clearly, the countries that are being removed, um, Georgia, Albania, Kosovo, Moldova, North Macedonia and Ukraine, are, those, are there any pr uh, service provisions that they are currently providing to Scotland, any healthcare services? And what it says... It removes the countries from certain health care services from bidding mm. for procurement. What what kind of health care services? That's a good question. Both of them are good questions. Um, it's, it's, it's updating um, the references to them, um, so they'll still be within the agreement, but the agreement has been altered by um, UK legislation post-Brexit uh, post to, as I say, exclude health care. Now, I'll ask officials if they can be more specific in terms of what exactly the health care provision has been excluded as. Um, all I can tell you is that it's to remove four categories of clinical healthcare services from the scope of the agreement. Uh, the removal was to ensure consistency between the UK government's wider approach to other trade agreements to ensure that it would align with the new legislation regime that's been introduced in the rest of the UK and also to protect the UK government's capacity to develop and deliver policy for domestic healthcare reform. So, yeah, I, I get that it's to bring us in line with the UK. But I'm just curious as to whether there is any provision currently being provided by these countries that would therefore uh, be terminated or not be able to be renewed. And when it says certain health care services, what yeah. kind of health care services? Maybe you could write to me and let me yeah, know. You could certainly write back on, yeah. on that. In terms of are they providing anything at the moment, I'm not aware. I'd be probably be surprised no. if they were. But, again, we will check if there is anything, um, as far as we know, because we may not know if there is anything. But we'll let what we know and get back to you. Thank you. Do you have any further questions from members? Uh, no, I will now move to agenda item three, which is formal consideration of the motion to approve the instrument. Uh, and I invite the minister to speak to and move the motion. Uh, moved. Thank you. Uh, do any members wish to make a contribution at this stage? No. Uh, so that then uh, concludes uh, the discussion and I'll put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S6M14474 be approved. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, thank you, we're all agreed, and the motion is therefore approved. A short factual report of the committee decision will be prepared and published, and our members content to delegate responsibility to me as convener for agreeing the committee's report. Thank you. So I thank the Minister and his officials for joining us today, and I briefly suspend the meeting to allow for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you. Thank you.
So our next item of business uh, this morning is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Gaelic. Uh, I welcome Kate Forbes, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Gaelic. Aidan Griswood, uh, Director of Jobs and Wellbeing Economy. Keith MacDonald, Unit Head, Strategy Division. And Richard Rollison, Director of International Trade and Investment, uh, all with the Scottish Government. Uh, thank you for attending um, this morning. Um, Cabinet Secretary, if I could maybe start with an initial question about the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, which a number of members have questions uh, they wish to ask. There has been a degree of confusion um, around the next plans for NSET, and that could be down to a change of Cabinet Secretary. Your predecessor did say they would do a refresh. Um, and understand you wrote to me recently to explain the position. I've also received a letter from Richard Leonard, the um, convener of the Public Audit Committee, um, and I think other members will want to pursue some of those issues. But one of the things they've asked us to do is to seek clarity in terms of a refresh. Now, the letter you sent to me, you did say the intention is not to have a, a reset or a refresh. The intention... Would well, you want to explain to us what the tension is? The yes. Tension uh -huh. is so, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, for starters, for having me back. Um, I think last time I met in May, uh, we were in the pre-election period, if I recall, uh, yes. and it maybe constrained elements of what I could say. So, uh, very delighted to be back uh, and speaking slightly more freely uh, in that regard. So, when I uh, returned to government in May, there had been uh, plans around uh, an NSET refresh, um, and uh, I decided that was not the direction that I wanted to go in. Uh, the reasons being that the First Minister had been quite clear in the first few days of his uh, tenure that he wanted fewer documents written and more actions delivered, and the idea of uh, refreshing a strategy and all the work that would go with that only a couple of years into a 10-year strategy didn't seem like the best use of our time. The second reason was that, to my mind, there was an opportunity with the programme for government to really clarify the actions that we were going to focus on. Now, all the actions are very aligned to the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. So the programme for government allowed us to be really clear with stakeholders and with Parliament about the priorities um, and thirdly, my sense of the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, which is a 10-year strategy, was always that some actions would be easier to deliver, some actions would be more straightforward to deliver. I think, unless my uh, officials uh, correct me, we have uh, delivered about 25% of uh, the actions are complete, 54% um, of actions are in progress, and you know, th some of the things that have, are complete are the rollout of, of tech scalers, which... Uh, I think, still largely enjoys the support of all parties in Parliament. So we've been able to make progress on those elements. Uh, there are other things that I think require us to have greater focus and attention. An example would be on uh, attracting investment. So there was a lot in the programme for government about how we are going to accelerate the actions within NSET on uh, attracting investment. So those are some of the reasons why I decided that in the spirit of the First Minister's uh, commitment to write less, do more, we should write less and do more with the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. um, could I maybe move on to a different subject just now? We'll come back to NSEC with other members. Um, as part of our pre-budget scrutiny, we took evidence from Visit Scotland, and you'll know that they've had an in-year adjustment of their budget, and they did tell us this meant that planned digital campaigns couldn't go ahead in this year. Now, they explained to us that the timescales for their businesses mm. was the impact happened in year, uh, so it will have a direct, they anticipate it will have a direct impact on our tourism sector this year by scaling back on some of the digital. Now the tourism sector, you know, and, and you'll be well familiar with the kind of package of measures that they believe they need for support. Some of those are reserved, they do talk about VAT on the sector, but some of them are uh, devolved around business rates, they've expressed some concerns around divergence and uh, income tax policies. Um, so, in what ways are the, you know, what priority within NSET does tourism have? If you yeah. compare us to somewhere like Ireland, the kind of investment they put in, um, you know, puts us in the shade. It's not the same scale. 
and how do we make sure that tourism is prioritised? Yeah, well, tourism is, is, is very much prioritised uh, in my own diary, in my own engagement with uh, stakeholders just on uh, Friday night uh, at the Thistle Awards, uh, recognising the brilliant work that tourism businesses do. And Visit Scotland plays an important role in that regard. So uh, their marketing spend delivered around £56.7 million uh, pounds of additional net economic uh, benefit. So we are aware of uh, the great work that Visit Scotland does. And they're obviously accountable in part to the industry too. Uh, and I hope the industry uh, is confident in the work that they, uh, they do. I certainly am. You talked about some of the, the challenging decisions that we've had to take, and I don't think any part of the Scottish Government's budget has been uh, immune to some of those uh, difficult decisions. I'm quite uh, relieved that within my own budget area, um, there actually hasn't been a, a huge amount of impact uh, since the summer. Uh, we have had an impact on Visit Scotland, and uh, that is... Um, uh, obviously a, a matter of concern, but there is work that Visit Scotland can do. That impact was on the marketing budget, um, and so there is work that Visit Scotland uh, will, will do, and which I've discussed with them, about how they can do more in-house work uh, rather than uh, outsourcing uh, that. But I, I shared with them my own uh, disappointment and concern, but this is the, the realities of the extremely challenging financial environment in which we're currently operating. Now, it might be questions more for the Finance Secretary, possibly, but in terms of business rates reform and the income tax issue, and I think we've previously asked if there's work being undertaken to see if the divergence is having an, any kind of impact, whether that's positive or negative. Is there, so the question is, is there work being done within the Scottish Government to track what the impact of divergence in income tax policy is? And are we going to see progress on business rates reform? Yeah, so that, that would be more appropriately put to the, the finance sector, but I'm very conscious of the uh, impact it has on the uh, businesses and the organisations that I represent around the Cabinet table. And uh, there has been work obviously conducted through HMRC in terms of the impact on uh, behaviour, particularly on uh, net migration to Scotland. Um, I think it was yesterday, um, statistics uh, on, on population as well, which are important to take into account. But yes, the Scottish Government uh, keeps the behavioural impact under review mm -hmm. and must do, because the Scottish Fiscal Commission obviously uh, models the behavioural impact of every tax rate. So I think it often bypasses uh, people, although I'm sure it doesn't bypass this committee, that when it comes to the Scottish Fiscal Commission's it figures on what it assumes the Scottish Government will raise through a particular income tax change, they model in the behavioural impact. So you will see that on the SFC tables, where they will model what the Scottish Government is set to uh, gain if all things remain equal, but what they will actually receive because of the behavioural impact. Thank you. And uh, before I move to um, Colin Smith and we go back to NSET, could I just ask about the Chief Entrepreneurial Advisor? Um, so Mark Logan's term was initial two years, which expired in September. And I'm just wondering um, what evaluation has been made of that role and whether Mark Logan is still in post or what the status of that is. Yes. So um, as you can imagine, uh, when it comes to spending any penny at the moment, um, we have to take a, a very robust approach to the impact that uh, a policy or a person is having. Um, I am hugely uh, enthusiastic about the work that Mark Logan is doing. Uh, if I look at uh, the work that he was originally tasked with, which was around the, the network of, of tech scalers, of increasing the pipeline of entrepreneurship and increasing the pipeline of uh, business startups, the uh, track record of tech scalers has been uh, really inspiring. It's something, it's a major piece of, of infrastructure, as it were, that has been delivered uh, without much fanfare, without much noise, hasn't been subject to too many uh, parliamentary questions or uh, too many uh, concerns raised by opposition MSPs because it has uh, been really successful and it has exceeded the initial expectations that were set down for it. So it has exceeded the initial um, expectations around number of business, uh, how much additional funding they have leveraged in. Uh, and my hope is that that will continue to grow. So um, in terms of those metrics, uh, I've been very impressed. Uh, he is now uh, working uh, very closely uh, in another area uh, within the NHS. So working closely with uh, Neil Gray to try and deliver 
uh, more uh, innovation within our NHS. Uh, within uh, a matter of months, uh, I've already seen a, a mm -hmm. step change in some of the work that the NHS is doing in terms of taking some of the most exciting uh, innovations we have in the life sciences sector and ensuring that there is an open door in the NHS to uh, embed that. And some of the uh, results from a, from a health uh, service perspective are astonishing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the digital dermatology project, uh, which can cut waiting lists uh, quite significantly, would be another uh, outcome. So um, maybe it would be helpful uh, for the committee if I were to write more formally just to outline what we think the successes have been of having someone in that role uh, who understands uh, the private sector, who has the confidence of the public sector and who just brings a different way of thinking uh, to uh, the work that we're doing around innovation within the public sector. Yeah, that might be helpful. And also it might be... So I'd be interested in what capacity the work he's doing with Neil Gray is, if it's as a special advisor or is it as a, you know, is it a paid post, is it a post that was recruited, is it what kind of post? Oh, can I just absolutely clarify, clarify he's definitely not a special advisor. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, he it's, it's very important that he is, um, he's not uh, in any way uh, recruited as a, per a special advisor, he's not a political appointment. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, I, I have encouraged him in the past, and I think he's taken this on board, to engage with other parties in the Parliament, to brief on what is being done, uh, to take on board any views, <coughs> thoughts, uh, ideas. Um, but he is, I, I have to say that very explicitly, he is not and can never be a, a yeah. political appointment. Uh -huh. okay. What kind of appointment is it? Do you know our it's a, it's a, He's a, he's a civil servant. He's a civil servant. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, OK, we move on to uh, Colin Smith, to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Kabina, and good morning um, to the panel. Cabinet Secretary, when you last appeared before the committee, I asked you about the, the level of investment needed to deliver uh, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation at the stem from concerns by Audit Scotland, who said the Scottish Government has not determined how much is needed to deliver and say this creates a risk to financial management and public accountability. And I've just confirmed you don't intend to refresh um, NSET, so the government's had plenty of time to establish the level of investment needed uh, across government departments to deliver the strategy. So has this been done? So I'm very delighted to return to an area that we had an exchange on uh, in the past and to repeat once again why I do not believe it is appropriate to uh, associate a single line of budget to the NSET uh, programme. I very much respect Colin Smith has a different view on that. I, I very much respect uh, the fact, uh, the comments that Audit Scotland made, uh, but uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm just not going to change my mind on uh, the uh, suggestion that we have one budget line associated with NSET because it completely undermines the view I have of NSET, which is that it should be for all of government to deliver. I've just given an example there about the work that's going on in the health service around innovation. Quite self-evidently, that would not be included within a single budget line on NSET. And the minute that we resort back to the siloed approach on budgets, we have completely uh, uh, eliminated the core purpose of NSET, which is to try and deliver economic prosperity right across government. I think, to be fair to Audit Scotland, they are not calling for a single budget line. They are actually calling um, for shared budgets across departments for NSET. In fact, Audit Scotland said the Scottish Government needs to have financial processes that can easily identify and analyse relevant spending across government. So they're very clear it's across government, not a single budget line. So do you know how much each department allocates towards the delivery of NSET? Well, can I, on, on its Scotland's, Audit Scotland's views, it has also obviously talked about the complexity of um, uh, delivering NSET. And we have uh, taken on board uh, their recommendations on the need for political leadership, on the uh, finance points, on metrics and on uh, evaluation uh, more uh, generally. So we are, um, in terms of tracking the cumulative spend related to a strategy as vast as NSET, it, it does continue to be uh, tricky. Uh. And I still am strongly of the view that it is counterproductive. But, you know, we, we are... We take on board these things and we're looking at ways to use new corporate systems to better track spend on prioritised actions. But I, I'm, I'm, I hope the committee hears just my incredible reluctance and concern about trying to boil NSET down to a particular budget rather than trying to embed 
the aims of NSET, which are around innovation, attracting new finance, uh, doing things differently. I mean, these are all laudable aims, and uh, government is its own worst enemy when it tries to boil that down into one siloed area or into one, uh, one pot of funding. Again, I think it's important to stress that, that, that there is no suggestion that there should be a single budget line or um, silo working, in fact, quite the opposite. In Audit Scotland, were very clear, they said there's a lack of transparency about directorate decisions on allocation of funding for NSET. Uh, it goes on to say there's a risk that NSET objectives are not being given the same priority by all directorates when it comes to funding decisions. So it is important to, to stress it's not silo working, it's actually quite the opposite. There's a concern that NSET does need to be required across directorate, but because of the lack of clear budgets on what each department allocates towards NSET, it's not clear what priority each directorate gives towards that. So. You know, why do you think Audit Scotland are calling for this if this is not necessary? Well, um, can I ask uh, uh, Aidan Griswood to come in? Because you did talk about just directorates, and he obviously oversees the work um, from the official side. Yeah, thanks. Um, I suppose just on, on that specifically, just in terms of, sort of cross government prioritisation, just a bit of reassurance around the programme for government, of which economic growth is one of the four key priorities. And one of the important things and steps in terms of providing assurance on that programme for government was the role that accountable officers play in each, um, for each area in confirming that the commitments that are made in the programme for government are, are affordable and deliverable. Um, so there's a process there for making sure that you know, there's the funding is available um, for, for those commitments within um, the PFG, so obviously the economic growth priorities within the PFG encapsulate those delivery plans for, for what will be taking forward NSET. Um, and then evidently there's the budget itself, you know, and, and again, those, in order to make sure that we have that line of sight from the PFG through to the budget, um, you know, funding will need to be allocated to specific commitments made within the programme for government. Um, but uh, but as, as the Deputy First Minister says, some of, some of those across uh, go across departments um, and evidently the scale of the, the, the commitment in terms of you know, the choices around how they are delivered um, could be made a, a, after the budget. But, but it's obviously not clear how much each director is actually allocating towards the delivery of, of NSA, which I think is what Audit Scotland's um, concerns um, are. I, I mean, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned the other recommendations from Audit Scotland. There are eight contained within the report in February. I mean, how many of these have now been implemented in full? So um, we obviously published um, our second annual progress report um, on in June, um, and uh, that lists all the actions that have been delivered and what stage they're at in the NSET programme. But I'm assuming you're talking about the Audit Scotland report yeah. itself. Are you? Yeah. So on, um, maybe I could give an update on, on some of the main recommendations. So on political uh, leadership, that was one of the um, points I think that uh, Audit Scotland had uh, recommended. We uh, did uh, a quick review of governance to look at how we could further strengthen political leadership and the First Minister has formally agreed to the creation of a, a cabinet uh, subcommittee on investment and the economy um, on the 24th of September. So uh, that provides the oversight, the political oversight from with membership from uh, across the cabinet uh, table. Um, in terms of uh, some of the other, uh, on metrics, uh, we have um, identified additional metrics that can be used to better track the outputs uh, and the medium-term delivery. Um, there are some that was, al that, that was already happening, for example, re gathering regular data from TechScaler on the spread and impact of uh, member uh, businesses, and the majority of our metrics uh, do show a, a positive change, and that was highlighted in the second uh, annual uh, report. Um, and the measures selected for the strategy help us to track progress towards the long-term transformational changes that we see for our economy, because well, obviously we have uh, monthly uh, metrics that are not uh, owned by uh, the NSET team, but look at things like uh, GDP growth, they look at uh, job creation, and I was very heartened, I don't know if the committee's seen it yet today, um, to see the figures uh, released by the Royal Bank of uh, Scotland uh, today in terms of uh, job creation uh, accelerating. Um, so there's some real positives uh, there. In terms of other... Um, 
Uh, that, that also covers the evaluation. Uh, Audit Scotland recognised that it was too early to assess the impact of NSET, but in the most recent NSET annual report, an additional section was added to discuss the results of early evaluation work. So I think that covers um, uh, quite a number of the high-level recommendations that the NSET, uh, sorry, that uh, Audit Scotland um, had uh, had identified. Unless anybody else wants to come in on additional metrics. No? So, so, so what would you say was, I'm looking at the recommendations, all the eight recommendations, now you've touched on a, a couple, but how, how many do you think have been delivered in full? Well, I think we, you know, we, we've had a debate just there around uh, the best way to monitor spend. Um, and I suppose with the, these recommendations, uh, taking them on board, we have delivered uh, on quite a number of them, and some we may just have a difference of opinion on, on how to do them uh, as effectively as possible, like the like the finance one. But feel free to put, if you want to put any others to me directly, and I can respond to them. The, the finance one is clearly the, the, the main concern of, of Audit Scotland. I, I, I mean, do you think that the, the argument you're making would, 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 would hold water in the private sector? Imagine a, a project Absol manager, say, an, you know, an engineer with responsibility for a, a major strategy for his company said to his bosses, there's going to be a ruthless focus on delivery, but I can't tell you how much investment is needed to deliver it. I don't know how much is being spent two years after that strategy was wrote, written. Um, I think that uh, uh, in the private sector, uh, a business whose uh, entire focus is on a particular aim and end would think it quite uh, strange to be asked to provide the budget for that end and aim. The whole point of the National Strategy for Economic Transformation is it genuinely needs to be the entire government's focus. And I think the last time we, we discussed this, you know, I would like to see every penny that the government spends being spent on ways to innovate. You know, the, the entirety of uh, the health secretary, the health uh, budget, for example, is clearly spent on delivering, um, on improving people's health and well-being. Now, we can do that effectively through NSET by attracting as much investment as possible into the country to increase the revenue, to reinvest in the health secretary, in the health uh, service, sorry. We can also do that through um, innovation, better ways of doing things. So, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from. I am just knowing the way that these things go. The minute that I publish a figure, it immediately excludes areas that I really want to be more about innovation and about the NSET aims. And also within the parliamentary debate, you get hung up on a particular figure and it completely undermines the whole point of the NSET way of thinking being embedded in every portfolio. Progress. Thank you. Uh, Willie Coffey to be followed by Lauren Slater. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the issue about NSET there that was led by Colin Smith. Uh, when I was a member of the Audit Committee, one of the issues we, we focused on was how the national strategy for our economic transformation supports and interacts with our regional economic development partnerships. And being a member from Ayrshire, I'm particularly interested in how that develops. Um, I, I wouldn't say there were particular problems raised, but we were interested to see in how the government evidences how NSET will benefit communities like Ayrshire. Um, yeah. if, you, if you look at population trends, Cabinet Secretary, that have only been recently released in the few, last few days, you'll see Scotland's population increasing, but particular areas in Scotland increase far greater than others. And to try to generalise that, perhaps it would be fair to say that the south and west and the islands populations are mm -hmm. diminishing, while the north and east populations are increasing. So is the government aware of that? Does it see that as an issue in terms of delivery of NSET for those particular parts of Scotland and how do we plan to rebalance it, if at all? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's another reason which I didn't uh, give to, to Colin Smith for why I am clearly giving the strong impression of my reluctance to put figures on this. Because we also recognise other partners in the... Um, aims of the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, including local authorities, uh, including um, parts of the private sector as well, and that's where regional economic partnerships come in, because they are uh, partnerships. And I've had quite uh, extensive engagement uh, with them over the last few uh, months. Uh, just on Monday, I was in Shetland. I actually was 
concerned yesterday I might not get back in time for this committee, but I was in Shetland until uh, yesterday afternoon. And on Monday, we had the Convention of the Highlands and Islands. Now, that is a, a grouping of all the local authorities that represent uh, coastal areas. So it stretches from North Ayrshire uh, up to Shetland. And uh, half the agenda was dedicated to the work of the Highlands and Islands uh, Regional Economic Partnership. And they are engaged in the work of um, attracting new businesses, but also in the work of um, delivering housing. So they are able, on a much more nimble level and a much more flexible level, a much more local level, to look at the issues that are uh, similar across those areas and work together to try and uh, bring solutions. Uh, and I was very clear with them that I would love this to be a very localised strategy, that government at a higher level is a, an enabler of what is going on locally. And at a local level, these partnerships, hopefully with the confidence of communities, identify what their big priorities are and can just get on with the job of doing it with the support of the national agencies. So in that case, with the support of Highlands and Islands Enterprise and ultimately with, with my support as well. Um, I would like them to be doing it along the, the lines of the, the NSET pillars because I think the pillars or the, the, the overarching aims in the NSET are still relevant. They're just as relevant as they were a couple of years ago. Uh, and it might be worth saying that at the time when it was published, there was a real pushback about the fact that we hadn't name-checked every sector under the sun. But my view was always that these aims should be sector neutral. You know, again, going back to this point around innovation, that should be equally applicable to any sector. So if a local regional economic partnership says where our priorities are energy, as they say in the Highlands and Islands, because that's quite obvious, um, then those aims should should uh, apply to, to that industry. Thank, thanks for that. W would you say that uh, a change in population, a positive change in population, is and should be an indicator of positive economic transformation? Because I have to say to you that the trend for Ayrshire despite a, a, a recent increase, a very small increase reported just uh, yesterday, I think, the trend is still down. So constituents would say to me that you've got this lovely national strategy for economic transformation, but really the population numbers in, East, in Ayrshire overall are still going down. How can we say to them, how can the government say to constituents like mine that our transformation strategy is being successful if overall numbers are leaving the, the county? Yeah, so um, this is an area that I have touched on in the past and it is a matter of concern, uh, particularly in uh, uh, rural coastal areas where we have seen, in some cases, uh, double-digit uh, forecasts of decline over uh, the last, uh, over, sorry, over the next uh, 40 years. Um, and perhaps that masks the fact, too, um, of the, the ageing demographics. So, um, that actually the impact on the working age population uh, is more stark. Uh, and the figures that were published in, uh, sh that we discussed actually in Shetland uh, over uh, Monday was uh, quite, quite concerning in terms of the expected uh, growth in sort of the over uh, 50 population, but the significant um, shrinking of uh, the working age uh, population and the strain that will have. So uh, absolutely, uh, I think that is why it is so imperative that we take a cross-government and cross-nation uh, approach to economic prosperity. And too often, I think, we assume that economic activity only happens within, within the private sector. You have third sector organisations, you have obviously um, uh, good work that can go on uh, in collaboration with the public sector, uh, and that needs to be you know, distributed around the country as much as possible. Okay. Thank you for that for the moment, convener. Um, if I can come back in later on on some of the other issues. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Lauren Slater to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will know herself that I'm, um, I think that a, a good green industrial strategy is very, very important in terms of setting Scotland out as a place for investment in key sectors as we move forward in the just transition. But I've, I've noticed an incoherence between the NSET and the Green Industrial Strategy, which I'm hoping the Cabinet Secretary can elaborate on and, and maybe tell us how she's going to align them. So within the NSET, there's a list of 14 opportunities. Now, I would expect 
any sort of, and that's four, that's a, quite a long bullet list, many of which have uh, sub lists on it. I guess that doesn't come over as very strategic. That come over as a massive shopping list. It's wonderful that Scotland has so many opportunities, but that isn't strategic. So of course it makes sense that the green industrial strategy uh, is a shorter list. However, that short list is not a subset of what's in the NSET. Two of the things in the green industrial strategy don't appear in NSET at all. One is CCUS and the other one is this sort of energy intensive industry stuff, which include things like chemicals, paper, steel, all of which are great industries, but they neither CCUS nor these energy intensive industries were identified in NSA as opportunities. So how come they have suddenly appeared uh, out of nowhere, as it were, in the green industrial strategy as key opportunities? What evidence was used to generate the opportunities in the green industrial strategy versus those in the NSA? And how how are we supposed to know what our strategic priorities are when we've got two different and disparate lists? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I actually think it's a, a brilliant question. Um, and, you know, one comment I made when uh, the NSEP was published was uh, around the fact that with a 10-year strategy, uh, it was, there was elements of risk because none of us knew what uh, the next year would hold. And I suppose, uh, reflecting back on the last uh, two years, there has been quite a lot of uh, turbulence and change uh, and, and so on. So anything within the NSET, uh, there's an element of, of risk attached to anything that you put down as fact. Uh, and that's where I think a uh, sort of refocusing in the programme for government uh, this year to what we're going to do in the coming year that's in the spirit of NSET was so important. But in terms of um, the green industrial strategy, I will ask if, if any of my officials want to come in because um, obviously by the time I, I came into office, it was essentially uh, drafted um, and, uh, and, and ready to go. Um, my uh, main uh, changes to it were very much about focusing as much on action as possible. So taking what had been contained within the green industrial strategy, but saying, right, the, what, answer the so what question. What does that mean? Um, my understanding of the green industrial strategy was very much that it was a, a, it was a prospectus approach. So its audience is those that are interested or open to doing business in Scotland and considering making investments. And it needs to sit alongside uh, other documents. So I see the NSET document as being owned by everyone, whoever you are, whether you're a local councillor or you are the first minister or you are uh, somebody that is uh, employing people in Scotland. It is a national document that gives us a northern uh, light over the next 10 years. Within that, we have more focused uh, documents or strategies that are published. And the Green Industrial Strategy was very much, it was punchy, it was pointed, it was written for a potential investor audience rather than written for all the other uh, audiences that we have. And it has to sit alongside uh, other documents. But I wonder whether somebody wants to speak to the process or how it evolved, because I wasn't, um, I wasn't involved. Yeah, I'll speak to that. So just as a bit of background on the green industrial strategy, there was a wide range of analytical work, evidence gathering and engagement with industry and other stakeholders really around getting to the key opportunities for Scotland where we have strengths and where there are both domestic and international opportunities for growth. So both growing the economy in Scotland, but also export opportunities in those strengths as well. Um, the connection with the NSEP piece, so there's a opportunity area NSEP, which was called New Market Opportunities. So we see GIS, the five areas in the GIS around wind, hydrogen, carbon capture, professional services and those clean industries you spoke about, really put a bit more meat on that new market opportunities area. And I think also the enablers within the GIS, so skills, investment, supply chains, are also covered in NSET. So if you think if you did a Venn diagram of NSET and the green industrial strategy, there's actually quite a lot of overlap there. Uh, thank you. In terms of the evidence that was used to determine those five things for the green industrial strategy, why did those things go in the prospectus, especially as two of them weren't even part of the national strategy for economic uh, transformation? Do you want to? I think uh, it just comes on automatically. Uh, yeah. Um, let me need to 
come back on some of the detail of that. Uh, but the analytical work essentially looked at a wide range of different opportunities, did more work perhaps than we'd done around NSET, around the specifics, and added those two that you speak about from the original ones within NSET. Uh, I'd be really interested in learning more about how that green industrial strategy was developed in terms of the evidence there, if that's possible. Sure. Thank you. So my second question, um, you've touched on slightly, which, we'll, which I'll elaborate on a bit more, and that is about the second PFG priority, which is economic growth, growing the economy. And the reason I have a question about that is, I have a question about what that means, because economic growth can be associated with increase of inequality, letting the rich get richer. It can be associated with trashing the environment. Both of those things will give you great GDP figures, but they do not lead to the well-being economy that we also claim to want. So the, the update to the national performance framework and the new proposed national outcomes, I, that was a good bit of work. I support that. It had community engagement. It talked about low, you know, public transport, really the things we need to do. How do you square this sort of full charge for economic growth, which can cause environmental havoc inequality, with saying that what we're going to measure, how we're going to measure our success, is this proposed national outcomes, which is so much based on a well-being economy. Because it feels like those are two different things. You're measuring one thing whilst trying to achieve another. Um, thanks. So, so I gave quite a lot of evidence yesterday to the Finance Committee on our national performance uh, framework uh, changes. And it was interesting there because um, there was a, a general um, criticism about there not being enough focus on economic growth in, in that. And I think what we are trying to do with the national performance framework is, uh, I think, a way of painting a picture for the Scotland we want to be. And I don't think there's much disagreement with any of the objectives. I think there's general consensus. You have to build consensus with something like that. You know, it, talking about um, uh, you know, people's uh, health and, and well-being, talking about uh, economic uh, uh, prosperity and, and so on. Uh, they're aligned with sustainable goals, UN sustainable goals, and uh, it's a very laudable um, uh, aim. And if, if Keith wants to come in on that, he, he's welcome to. But they, they set out, again, the country that we want to be. The First Minister has taken that and he's distilled it down into four objectives. And I'm a big fan of, of distilling things down into fewer objectives, one of which is economic growth. Now, you uh, said that um, it can lead, and I agree, but it doesn't have to lead. I think it depends on what you see, the aim, and economic growth. The reason I argued yesterday that, that economic growth shouldn't be an end in and of itself in the, in the uh, national performance framework is because it's not an end in and of itself. It is a means to an end. And if you just view it as an end in and of itself, then absolutely, you bake in inequality, you uh, destroy the environment, so on, so forth. But if you see it as prosperity with a purpose, in other words, we cannot reinvest revenue into our public services unless we have a growing economy that raises the standard of living for everybody, that then raises the revenue that can be reinvested. And um, We cannot have... Um, you can't meet our, uh, our, our net zero goals unless there is also a uh, private investment being made because uh, the cost of meeting our net zero goals uh, far exceeds the, the, the public sector resources of any government under the sun. And so we have to be an attractive place to do business so that we see that, that investment. Uh, and so my view on economic growth is uh, not that it's an end in and of itself, but it is a means to an end. But we can't achieve the ends without economic growth which is perhaps where there would be a, a, a minor disagreement, I think, perhaps, between us. But, I, but I'm open to answering any more questions on that. Yeah, I think the difficulty is when we set, as it does in the PFG, as the goal is growth, it doesn't at all give reassurance that that growth won't be just a pursuit of GDP, maximising GDP whilst causing negative outcomes elsewhere. So I think it's misleading to say our goal is growth, when actually our goal is, if, as the Cabinet Secretary sets out, this well-being economy where people's lives are improved and communities are strengthened and um, businesses are safe to invest. Now, that might mean GDP is, it comes down a couple of notches because we need to redistribute wealth or we need to invest more in public services. So I think it's important to be clear whether we're going after a well-being economy rather than maximising a single metric, no matter what the cost to society. Yeah, I suppose my difficulty with that is that 
Whilst we obviously are uh, delighted when we see uh, an increase in economic growth, economic growth has been incredibly stagnant across the UK for a long time. And child poverty figures have increased. Um, we have had huge uh, pressures on our public services. And I see no conflict between the four aims that the Programme for Government set out. Uh, and in fact, I do not think there is a way to tackle child poverty without a growing economy. I see no way of meeting our climate change objectives, and obviously uh, that was a, an aim and programme for government without economic growth increasing. And I see no way of protecting and supporting our public services without economic growth increasing. And so actually, if you look at the four aims and programme for government, they are all mutually dependent on each other. And if we were to take out that economic growth um, you know, as one of the four legs, the stool would topple over. It, it, you know, it just it just can't stand. I, and uh, you know, I suppose all of us. Uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we would necessarily admit every single uh, decision that the Irish government has taken. But I mean, who can look at the most recent Irish government uh, budget in terms of its support for people in fuel poverty, its support for families with kids, its support for infrastructure, and not be envious of what they've been able to achieve with a considerably higher? Uh, economic uh, economic growth. So I think there is an argument here about how Scotland can achieve its aims and ambitions. I just don't think there's a route to it without economic growth. Gordon MacDonald, followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you so much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I've got a couple of areas I want to ask you some questions on. first one is Ferguson Marine. Um, the committee recently visited Ferguson and, and saw the situation uh, where the yard's facing a lot of challenges in terms of its uh, prospects for new orders, etc. And I just wanted to ask you about the £14 million pounds that the government announced was putting into funding. What are the specific outcomes you want this investment to deliver? Uh, thank you. So we have always uh, been of the view that we want Ferguson Marine to have uh, a long and sustainable uh, future because of the role that it plays. And clearly the, the short term objective, uh, which perhaps is, uh, um, is hopefully uh, coming to a conclusion uh, soon, was to deliver uh, both vessels. Um, but over and above that, I believe that Ferguson Marine's future is in uh, competing internationally for new orders. And over the last few years, they have been totally focused on uh, delivering the two vessels. So now that uh, some of that work is coming to a conclusion, there is an opportunity to reinvest in the yard, to make it fit for purpose, to enable it to compete. So, for example, some of the uh, funding could be uh, invested in uh, facilities uh, that are more in line with uh, all other successful yards of that size and type. Um, and that the, there was a lot of due diligence work. You'll know that the original bid uh, was rejected. So this is a, a new uh, bid uh, that is currently undergoing uh, due diligence work uh, to make sure that we can um, uh, uh, make that investment. Yeah, so one of the other things I wanted to ask about Ferguson's was the Scottish Government owns a number of companies. It owns Calmac Ferries, which is the biggest um, ferry company in the UK, which doesn't have a repair yard. It has Seamal, which owns the ferries, and it gets its, it gets its vessels repaired, predominantly at uh, Camel Laird on Merseyside. Surely there's an argument, if we want a long and sustainable future for that yard, is to amalgamate all three companies where you're going to have a situation where you will have economies of scale, you'll remove duplication of overheads, and you will give that future that the yard requires. I mean, the vessels were part of Calmac Ferries pre-2006, pre and we have a yard that could be guaranteed a future if the biggest ferry company in the UK had its own repair yard. So there... 
This has been uh, considered in the past. There has been uh, quite extensive work at looking at some of those opportunities that you identify in terms of um, efficiencies uh, and um, and so on. Um, there are quite uh, significant uh, legal issues with um, any amalgamation of uh, those three organisations that you, you mentioned. Uh, and the Transport Secretary would be probably uh, better suited to answering uh, the, the technical elements of, of why uh, they have uh, different forms of governance, they have different forms of uh, ownership. Um, and certainly the aim for uh, Ferguson Marine was to uh, get the boats built and then to uh, return it to the, the private sector, but to a buyer who believed in continuing to, uh, to build boats uh, on the, on the Clyde, so there there have been uh, quite extensive reviews of what might be possible in terms of amalgamation, um, but some of them have been um, sort of dismissed on the basis that uh, they're not possible under the current governance arrangements of each of the three parts, the the tripartite as it were. Uh, but if the committee is interested, I'm sure the transport secretary could uh, write with an update on uh, the progress on that question, because it it's a very fair question that the government has been very interested in in the past. And I don't know if any officials wants to... No, we'll, we'll, we're happy to respond. OK, thanks very much. The, the other area I wanted to look at was in terms of the green industrial strategy and the commitment the government gave to modernise compulsory purchase legislation. Uh, can you say a wee bit about um, what's happening with that? Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, the green industrial uh, strategy, the aim here is to try and make it as simple and straightforward to deliver on our objectives. And there's a number of uh, below the five opportunity areas. Uh, there's a, a number of um, objectives or a number of actions of what the government will do to uh, create a successful enabling environment for investment and growth with targeted actions. Now, those targeted actions include things like skills, research, investment, supply chains, planning and consenting and housing. Now, clearly, a lot of that relies on access to land mm -hmm. Uh, and access to facilities. Mm -hmm. And every uh, week I have conversations with potential investors who are looking for uh, scale, uh, they're looking for size. And if you look in and around the, the, the Cromarty Green Freeport area, they're talking about the need for 25,000 new homes. Mm. Um, and therefore, by extension, that will require um, uh, land. So I don't know on the specifics of... Um, on compulsory purchase, if anybody has anything to add, but I would imagine that that is part of the toolbox of um, of in order to enable us to meet the requirements, the growing requirements for for land access and to deliver thousands of homes. It's, cer it's certainly something that the committee has an interest in when we carried out our town centre. Um, and retail inquiry back in November 22. Um, one of the issues that we looked at was compulsory purchase legislation. And the reason, the, the feedback we got from local authorities was that they couldn't use it, the legislation because of lack of funding. In order. So um, one of the aspects that was looked at at the time was compulsory sale orders. And I know the government did a bit of work on that through the Scottish Land Commission back in 2018. Can you say anything about where we are with compulsory sales orders? I probably don't feel um, in a position to uh, speak to that in any great detail. So could I come back to the committee with an update on compulsory uh, sales orders in perhaps in the context of the Green Industrial mm. Strategy and also some of the reform work that's going on in planning right now because um, it's not independent of the aims in the programme for government around um, master plan consent areas and so on. It's kind of all part of the same world. 
So maybe it would be useful to come back just with um, more substantive okay. information. I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, thank you. Uh, Murdo Fraser to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Deputy First Minister and uh, colleagues. Can I start by asking a couple of budget-related questions? Um, I was enjoying the exchange you had a moment ago with Lorna Slater around economic growth. And I think it's fair to say that since you came back into government, there has been something of a shift in the language uh, in government with more of a focus on, on growth than perhaps we saw previously. But what we have seen in recent years is negative impacts on the enterprise budgets uh, in Scottish government. I remember asking your predecessor, Neil Gray, uh, about this um, last year. And we have seen the, the, the budgets of the enterprise agencies, of Visit Scotland, of employability programmes suffer quite severe cuts uh, in, the, in, in this year's budget, but also in previous year's budget. So I, I don't expect you to tell us what's going to be in the budget, but would you accept that if there is a new focus on economic growth, further cuts on the very areas of the budget that would help drive that growth are not going to be helpful? So my portfolio, perhaps uniquely in government, is one of the few that can actually generate revenue. And I agree that investing it through the enterprise agencies, also the investment bank, the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, is a means of uh, generating actually more medium term, immediate returns, and uh, secondly, supporting a growing, uh, prosperous economy more generally. So uh, I do agree with the premise that actually uh, there's a difference between supporting the enterprise agencies in their current form and giving them the capital to then be able to invest in other organisations. And they have made a number of um, extremely good uh, investments in recent years, Scottish Enterprise, uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and uh, Scottish National Investment Bank, which have um, uh, delivered uh, returns uh, for them. So you see that immediately, that, but then just more generally, they are a means of delivering overall prosperity. OK, thank you. Um, well, we'll see what's in the budget, I uh, dare say, in due yeah. course. Now, again, on bu budget-related issues, and the, the convener touched on this uh, in her questioning earlier, the committee had a lot of evidence around the tax differential. We heard that when we went to Presswick Airport in the spring. We've had witnesses come to the committee talk about a Scottish premium now having to be paid uh, to workers to uh, offset the higher taxes that are being paid. Um, I believe, if I believe what's in the, in the newspapers, uh, the policy chairman of the City of London is speaking to the First Minister today and raising some of these issues. So would you accept that f a further widening of the tax differential, income tax differential, would be counterproductive if it comes to pursuit of economic growth? So I strongly believe in listening to uh, stakeholders, but I also believe in basing policy decisions on evidence. And... The First Minister has said, and I join him in repeating it, that you cannot continually raise tax. Now, you raise the point of the differential, which is key in a devolved context. But I would also point to the evidence, and we know from the HMRC figures that there has been net immigration to Scotland of, on average, over 4,000 every year since tax was devolved. Now, I know that the member will say, well, that doesn't cover uh, this year, and uh, he's absolutely right. But to be fair, he has been saying it for uh, all the years where we do have evidence uh, as well um, that the differential will, will have, an, have an impact. And so I think the, the evidence uh, matters. I also point to the data that was released just yesterday on Scotland's population, which is a matter of great encouragement that Scotland's population rose faster than at any time since the 1940s in the year up to mid-2023. And National Records for Scotland said that the main driver of population growth over the period was people moving to Scotland from other parts of uh, the UK and abroad. Again, 
illustrating that there is a net inward uh, migration. So we have to balance all the many reasons why someone would choose to live in Scotland. And I think that whilst tax does clearly play a role, people take much broader decisions in the round about the general cost of living, about the resilience of our public services, about uh, the support from, from government and other parts of the public sector, and just about the economic activity that's happening here. All of those are reasons uh, to celebrate the fact that people are choosing uh, to move to the country. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the migration figures because I had a, a detailed look at those this morning. And you're absolutely right. In the year to uh, 2020, in the middle of 2023, 20, uh, the Scottish population increased 0.8 per cent, uh, based uh, entirely on inward migration. For the same period, the UK as a whole population increased by 1 per cent. So Scotland lags behind the overall UK growth by 20 per cent. So why is it, in, in your view, that the Scottish population therefore is growing less fast than the UK as a whole? So that is quite a remarkable sort of turning a positive that we can all get behind uh, into a, a, a negative. Um, I am conscious that in some of our... Uh, we, need, we need to drill down into these uh, numbers. I've asked for uh, more robust... Um, granular data on this. So, for example, where are people uh, settling? Um, you know, Willie Coffey raised the point around our rural uh, communities. You know, we've been talking, and I mentioned it in my answer to him, about National Records for Scotland's forecasts, which were um, essentially plateauing over the next 40 years with some significant drops in more rural areas and some, some significant increases in, in more urban areas. I think those figures disrupt uh, that, that general trend. Uh, but the bottom line is that when we look at Scotland's public services right now, my greatest worry is that it's the very people that we need that are most excluded by our current uh, immigration system and our visa system. You know, we heard from uh, Russell Finlay last week on delayed discharge. We have heard from a number of people about the concerns of delayed discharge. The big problem with delayed discharge is uh, workforce. And right now, uh, we know that there could be far more people in the country that are excluded from the country on the basis that they don't earn enough or are not considered to be skilled enough by the UK government, which is quite an affront to them, because I know that uh, many of us uh, entrust our uh, loved elderly relatives uh, to people. In Shetland on Monday, hearing about they've got massive housing sites that are ready to go, uh, the big problem is workforce. And they used to have uh, quite a number of Europeans working in Shetland, particularly in the construction industry. Um, and private sector construction businesses have told me that they've all now left uh, to go home. So, you know, where I would agree with Murdo Fraser is that we do have to drill down and this is a cause for celebration. But would I like to see there be higher levels of inward migration? Yes. Do I think that visas do have a role in that? Yes, I do. And obviously, I'm assuming that those figures would have been pre the most recent clampdown on uh, visas and immigration. We could, we could debate this issue all, all morning. I think what would be very interesting to see, in addition, is a breakdown of the demography of people leaving Scotland and those coming in. So if it's the case that people in their 20s and 30s are leaving and those coming in are in their 40s and 50s, that would also tell us something interesting. But, but, but maybe a reflection... Oh, excuse me, can I get Sorry. some order in the committee, please? Uh, one person speaking at a time. Carry on, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, but I don't know if we have access to that data. But maybe I could just ask another question because I'm conscious of time. Um, because when you came in May, I asked you about the New Deal for Business yeah. and how that was progressing. And at that point, you said, because of PERDA, you were constrained in what, what you can say. So can you give us an update on where we are with implementation of the 78 recommendations in the New Deal for Business? Yeah. So I have, since coming in, 
had two meetings with the New Deal for Business uh, group, uh, and I've been uh, very uh, enthusiastic about the progress that has been made. And I think the last meeting uh, was equally enthusiastic because we had worked quite closely with the New Deal for Business in shaping the programme for government. Um, and uh, the, the organisations represented on New Deal for Business were, um, and I think some of them said it publicly, uh, were very encouraged by the extent to which they saw their asks reflected in the programme for government. So we have made um, sub substantial progress. Clearly, the next focus will be on the budget. Um, and the Finance Secretary has met with some of the stakeholders, particularly around uh, hospitality businesses, to talk about what they want to see reflected in the, in, in the budget. So uh, I want there to be tangible evidence that the New Deal for Business is shaping uh, government uh, policy, because that was the promise that was made to them when it was uh, convened. One of the obvious examples where it's having an impact is the regulatory regulatory review group uh, headed up by uh, Russell Griggs and he and his team uh, essentially uh, review policy commitments made by the Scottish Government in all parts of, of government, so within the health service, within um, the environmental brief, to look at what impact it will have on uh, our economy and then feed that evidence in. And a number of the conversations that we now we had in the lead up to the programme for government actively took that into consideration and I suppose from a parliament perspective you'll never know what didn't make it but you'll see the final version and I know that throughout the twists and turns of all the conversations there was um, a lot of feedback from the New Deal for Business group and the regulatory review group which was reconvened if I remember correctly as a result of the New Deal for Business. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Brian, what told you wish a supplementary could, on I this could, point? If, if I could, brief. please. Yeah, I, 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 I'm really interested around the whole population yeah. uh, issue. And uh, the last time I looked at this, uh, the average working age in Scotland was 41. But the average age of people coming in from south of the border was 55. Um, so it, to, to murder Fraser's point is what we don't want to be doing is, is, is what was all classed as a brain drain, you know, our, our, our graduates leaving to go down south of the border and, and, and trying to understand who it is that's coming in. So I wonder if in, in terms of, you know, we don't look at it in the who you know the, the actual number itself, but how much the, the government have drilled down to find out what the economic impact of, of, of that sort of age disparity is. Yeah, so we don't see the data in advance of it pub being published. So it was published uh, yesterday, I believe, um, and uh, uh, we uh, have discussed it internally within government and the ask has been for that more granular drill down uh, to share across cabinet secretaries and across portfolios to better understand the implications. So I would uh, imagine that uh, Angus Robertson uh, would um, be able to return to parliament with uh, more, more of the data. And I think you know, it, it is helpful to understand it's under, uh, helpful to understand what is motivating people to move to Scotland mm. and how we can build on that uh, to motivate more people to move uh, to Scotland. But I also think that the rhetoric here is really important for two reasons. The first is that I will confess to being really disheartened when there is a constant drumbeat of negativity within our political discourse about why people shouldn't move to Scotland, uh, generally from the opposition, as to why everything's rubbish and uh, points around tax and so on. And I think we, we forget that has a negative impact on whether or not people want to move to the country. So I've often heard it said that the negative rhetoric about tax is more off-putting than the tax itself, and certainly has been over the last uh, few years. So the reason why this is interesting is... It is it's positive rhetoric about Scotland that we can actually all get behind. And that, I would hope, uh, encourages other people to move to Scotland. I think the second thing that's important here is how we respond. Because this government is proud to see an increase in migration to Scotland. We are delighted. We want Scotland to be a welcoming place 
for migrants, for immigrants. And if you were to look at what other parties are saying about their concerns about immigration, I think it is so, it's so important that we stand together in Scotland and say eh, we welcome immigrants, we want you to come here, we recognise that there's a moral imperative for us to welcome people, but more than that, there's an unashamed eh, economic imperative eh, to welcome people to Scotland. And if our problem has long been emigration, eh, how we respond to these figures, I hope, will eh, reverberate eh, across eh, our political discourse and perhaps further afield eh, to illustrate that we really do want people to, to make their home here. We could have a full session on this, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, Michelle Thompson to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Uh, good morning, panel. Thank you for joining us. We've been, we've been kind of nestling around the, the sides of the issue around budget through the course of this session. Uh, we know that the Scottish budget is going to be particularly tight and I think we all understand that without going into the detail of it but I'd appreciate given the cabinet secretary's relentless focus on economic growth although I know she says prosperity for purpose which I uh, definitely uh, agree with against a backdrop of very low UK productivity historically over a longer long-term trend against other comparable economies can the first of all the cabinet secretary set out her understanding of the kind of macro economic environment in the UK and how that restricted investment in particular in capital how that has a follow-on impact in what she's trying to achieve about economic growth to get that vital funding to pay for public services and, of course, increase our productivity. Yes, I can. And uh, Michelle Thompson's absolutely right to say that um, the wider UK environment is, uh, is a big determiner, determinator of uh, what happens uh, in Scotland. And we know that we have challenges around productivity that is linked to uh, reinvestment. It's linked to private reinvestment. Uh, it's linked to investment in innovation. And we therefore want to encourage as much of that investment to happen as possible. But that is a UK-wide uh, challenge and a UK-wide uh, trend. And how we are perceived internationally it has massive bearings on, on that. You know, I know um, of a, a number of uh, major corporations that have previously been active in the UK, uh, uh, left the UK uh, a couple of uh, a few years ago for various different reasons. Uh, and when we engage with them, they say they're very sympathetic to what the Scottish Government is trying to do. But at the end of the day, we are within the wider United Kingdom uh, and that will have a bearing on what they can or can't do. So what... Rachel Reeves does with the budget in uh, October is going to matter massively in terms of incentivising that reinvestment piece, um, uh, how uh, she will uh, use uh, the tax system to incentivise uh, reinvestment and how uh, she will ensure that the UK as a whole is considered to be uh, open for, for, for business um, because uh, that will either work in favour of what we're trying to achieve or against what we are trying to uh, achieve. The other big issue is, of course, um, uh, labour shortages. So um, the RBS today uh, talking about um, uh, the fact that uh, hiring activity uh, has surged, job creation reaching its highest levels since uh, May 2023. Uh, so, you know, that, that's really positive if the workforce are there. But if there are constraints on... Uh, uh, labour market, which we know that there are, uh, employers are continuing to face uh, staff shortages. In September, 24.7% of firms reported experience a shortage of workers, uh, although this is uh, lower than the average rate over 2023, which was 33%. So those macro trends and issues mm. uh, quite uh, clearly uh, have a, a, an impact. Um, and there has been quite a lot of speculation about how uh, Rachel Reeves might adjust debt and accounting rules to allow uh, greater capital and infrastructure uh, investment. And I would welcome that change and that flexibility. Uh, and actually, following on from that in terms of, of capital, um, capital has been extraordinarily important for our enterprise agencies and for Scottish National Investment Bank. 
And perhaps I could have some reflections on what the Cabinet Secretary uh, hopes to see for capital going forward and how critically the predicted cuts on capital of 20% over the next five years by the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the recent reported articles in the Financial Times about Rachel Reeves asking for a 10% cut in relative departments. What would be the implications on the Scottish National Investment Bank and Scottish Enterprise in particular? And before she answers that, I could also note that my understanding is that the use of financial transactions that have also been cut as a loan mechanism have been used because of the absence of capital. So that's almost potentially a double drop that limits economic growth and productivity. Yeah, so financial transactions uh, con grew considerably um, under the last uh, Conservative uh, government. And um, they were actually a very helpful resource for us in, uh, in housing, as your uh, neighbour sitting on committee uh, here will know. And um, they were a means for us to uh, significantly capitalise the Scottish National Investment Bank uh, mm -hmm. quite uh, rapidly. Um, and obviously financial transactions are, uh, are a loan mechanism, as you say. So um, they are not capital. They must be uh, returned to the Treasury at the right point, um, but they did allow us to uh, really extend the reach of our, our capital. And last year they were cut, if memory serves, by uh, over 60%. So a huge hit in one year. So if you think of all the, the housing programmes, the Scottish National Investment Bank programmes, which were reliant explicitly on financial transactions, to take on board that hit in one year was a, was a mammoth task. And it required us to redivert capital from elsewhere in order to continue to support um, those, uh, those parts. So we don't know what Labour will do with financial transactions. We don't know uh, how they feel about financial transactions. Uh, clearly, there will be more uh, consequentials if uh, the UK government increases what it is doing around, um, around housing. But at the end of the day, in order to capitalise the National Investment Bank, um, you know, we, we want to use capital, but there's there's a concern about re-diverting capital from new schools, new hospitals, new roads uh, to uh, the National Investment Bank. So we're going to have to have to weigh that up. Yeah, and in terms of re-diverting funds, uh, there there's sometimes talk of using revenue re-diverting into capital. Can she just outline what the implications are in other areas of the budget if that is to be to be done? Yeah, so in, 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 in some um, circumstances, you, you, can, you can switch. Um, but uh, you, uh, you know, revenue basically goes on people. You know, it's, it's spent on, on people. Mm -hmm. It's spent on uh, the wage bill of our nurses, our doctors, our, um, our frontline workers. And quite clearly, the government has set out its prioritisation of our people, because it's our people that, that serve uh, the public. And therefore, uh, to, to switch is, uh, is, is a really challenging uh, issue. Um, and at a time like this, where we are coming hopefully through, uh, but not quite out of, cost of living crisis, uh, high, high costs, um, erosion of our, our spending power, as we come out of this, now is the time to really inject uh, capital into major infrastructure projects and get the uh, get the economy growing and create that hive of activity that we know is very attractive mm -hmm. to uh, other 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 international organisations enterprises that that might want to be part of what we're doing in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, and my final question is: it's actually arguably a slightly uh, technical. Uh, one. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we had Scottish National Investment Bank and Scottish Enterprise in and there was commentary, and I'll just get the official record up from Michael Robertson from SNIB uh, talking about the perpetual status if you like, uh, the SNIB uh, Murdo, my colleague Murdo Fraser picked up on a question I had asked the year before about the UK government budgeting manual and how profit it was dealt with. I just wanted to get the Cabinet Secretary's understanding that the, how those, those UK budgeting rules do 
align specifically to the UK government rather than the Scottish government? And the reason I'm asking that question was that Michael Robertson said, where we see potential for advancement within the Scottish rules is on flexibility and potentially on multi-year investments. Mm. So I just wanted to, it's slightly technical, but just to kind of clarify what specifically is UK budget rules and therefore any flexibility? Yeah, so I'll, uh, let me make a stab at that and then... Uh, <laughs> I realise it's a bit technical, Richard, sorry. Uh, Rawson. No, this um, is has been a very pressing issue, though, since mm -hmm. the bank was first established. Because prior to the bank uh, being established, there was extensive conversations with the UK government and with Treasury to look at whether there could be any unique flexibilities within the fiscal framework specifically for the bank. And actually, a lot of work was done in terms of building cross-party support so that the UK government could have uh, the, the, the confidence that this was not a political play. This was very much about... Uh, supporting uh, the bank on those flexibilities. Um, one of the big flexibilities they would like to see is being able to uh, carry over budget um, across financial years. Because you know, any, any in investment house is going to make decisions uh, irrespective of where it falls in the, in the financial year. Whereas because of the lack of flexibility built into the fiscal framework in terms of carryover, if you are in nearing the end of March, you have this really difficult decision to make as to do you accelerate an investment decision uh, and in the process you know, carry a lot more risk or do you wait until the next financial year uh, and carry even more risk because you don't know what your budget uh, will be. So, it, so we have been in working with them to look at what flexibilities might be further afforded from within the Scottish Government budget but it is, uh, a, it is extremely difficult to see um, how we can do that without additional flexibility from the UK government on that. Richard, over to you for the better answer. Yeah, I think the <laughs> Cabinet Secretary is left with a slightly technical question here, which, which I think relates to, and I picked up on some of Michael Robertson's evidence to committee, you know, the way in which the bank treats income and losses uh, and the Treasury's consolidated budget guidance, which essentially puts any symmetry in those things. So if the bank makes a loss, there's a 100% Ardell hit on the bank. If the bank makes a gain, they get to keep 5% of that gain as Ardell, but 95% of it comes back as FTs, which need to be paid back. So there's a kind of asymmetry there. That's very clear. And my very last question, it taking, it's picking up on the points some of my colleagues made earlier. And I appreciate, Cabinet Secretary, you're responsible for the economy, but the, the ability to uh, promote growth course has to be linked to what happens with, with finances. In terms of just transition and net zero, to what extent do you think the recent Scottish Fiscal Commission report around getting to net zero, the key elements or some of the key elements of that are understood in an economic perspective? Primarily, that the UK can't get to net zero without Scotland. And secondly, that the fiscal framework, as structured at the moment, Scotland cannot, by law, make the sort of investment in, at scale that is required to trigger a just transition or get to net zero. Yeah. Yeah, what I make of it uh, is to say that I, I don't disagree with it that we uh, quite clearly, as a country, in, from a UK perspective, cannot get to net zero without what is happening in Scotland. And, of course, I would cheekily argue you can't get to net zero without the North and the North East, <laughs> uh, including uh, the Highlands and Islands. Uh, and that means that a lot of the focus is on, on, on Scotland. And just looking at some of the, the figures is, is astonishing at the moment in terms of the economic activity, uh, the, um, the uh, export potential of, of, of our energy uh, and looking at the investments that are being uh, made. So it is huge, but it requires an equally huge response from the government. And 
we can't uh, do that within uh, the fiscal framework, uh, in part because of uh, the sums of funding that are involved. So if you look at the budget, we have a capital budget of about, give or take, £5 billion a, a year. Um, and you'll know our limits on, on borrowing. And if you take Scotwind just as one example, Scotwind, 25 gigawatts, has the, the, those that have, um, have won the, the options or have won the, the, the leases have pledged between them all £25 billion pounds of investment in the supply chain. £25 billion pounds in the supply chain. We have a, an annual capital budget of £5 billion pounds designed to go on hospitals, everything. roads, Schools. on everything. It's huge. And any other country is responding to that huge opportunity with an equally huge offer. Mm -hmm. And if we want to, for example, take stakes in businesses in the supply chain, if we want to uh, ensure that the supply chain is able to respond, the, the level of demand there on a capital level far outstrips the small budget debates we will have about you know, our enterprise agencies and the Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, so the, the, the remarkable thing is that uh, from a GB energy perspective, it's not actually doing anything over and above what is already happening with the Scottish National Investment Bank yeah. and other mm -hmm. players. It's not actually adding any uh, additional uh, significant capacity. I'm not disputing, I'm delighted it's in Scotland and it's got a role to play and, and that's great and it's creating a hive of activity around it. But just in terms of meeting the scale of the need, mm -hmm. I think we all just need to, you know, get real uh, and, and get with what people are, are pledging to invest and recognise, you know, if we've got a £55 billion overall budget and these guys are, that's just one Scotland round, leasing round. It's just one, it's not even in TOG, it's not, it's not onshore, it's just offshore, £25 billion, pounds, half the Scottish Government's budget. Uh, it, it illustrates just the, the scale of this thing. Thank you for Thank putting you. that on the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, if we make some progress, I've got a couple of members left who wish to ask questions. If I had shorter questions and answers, that would be helpful. Uh, Kevin Stewart, to be followed by Brian Mottle. Uh, Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, good morning, uh, Deputy First Minister. Uh, Lorna Slater uh, mentioned the green industrial strategy earlier uh, and its uh, consist of consistency of purpose uh, to end set. I want to take that a little bit further uh, and look at how it um, actually melds with uh, the hydrogen action plan, um, the forthcoming energy strategy. Uh, and beyond that, um, I'd like your uh, opinions around about how all of that fits in uh, with UK strategies or does not. Uh, and you've said earlier on that you are focused on actions. Are there certain elements that are not within our control that are holding up um, actions? Well, uh, yes. If you, if you look at the five opportunity areas, I could take each one in you know, each one, uh, including hydrogen, and tell you about where I think we need far greater close, closer collaboration with uh, the UK government on uh, all of them. So um, if we take uh, something like carbon capture, uh, CCUS, uh, that's quite an obvious one where we ultimately need uh, the UK government to make uh, a decision, an investment decision, in Scotland's uh, opportunity. But when it comes to uh, some of the others, uh, the big issue that people will raise with me and they will raise with you consistently is around grid connection. So more generally, in terms of where we need close collaboration, we ultimately cannot deliver uh, the full scale of our ambition for these five opportunity areas without uh, a close alignment with UK government uh, strategies on all of them. So I suppose that's the that's general uh, gist of my response to that question. So in terms of the cooperation yeah. that we require, uh, I wonder if you could give us um, uh, your opinion around about whether that cooperation um, is as good as it should be. Let, let's take the example um, of hydrogen and the hydrogen action plan. Lots and lots of discussions uh, around this table and elsewhere about um, the possibilities for hydrogen. 
We've seen some of these possibilities uh, in my own neck of the woods with the Aberdeen Hydrogen Project, which has been on the go for uh, quite a long time now. But we're told that some of the difficulties that there are uh, are around about uh, UK regulation when it comes to transportation uh, and storage of hydrogen. How much are, are you doing to persuade the UK government uh, to make the moves to get this right, to allow for the investment that's required in our future? Yeah. So we uh, set out in our hydrogen action plan the decisions that we would take on, on hydrogen. And, um, you know, as you said, there have been a number of uh, pilots, pockets of activity. I, I know about the, 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 the level of, of activity of, of, of interested investors, developers, energy companies who want to explore and develop this. And so there is a lot of optimism about the potential. The key in all of these uh, energy industries is turning the potential into reality. And we need to work at pace, we need to work fast uh, to turn the potentially interested investors and developers into activity on, on the ground. So if, if we take, for example, the need to um, develop the, uh, the infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, export, uh, build, clearly that will require uh, close alignment with the UK government. If we take the, the generation of renewable energy, particularly around offshore wind, uh, the big sticking point is around this, uh, the access to a uh, uh, grid. So at the moment, the nature of our engagement is positive. We have had a lot of face-to-face um, -face engagement. I know that um, uh, the Secretary of State, Ed Miliband, and Gillian Martin have had quite a number of uh, discussions face-to-face -face about what each side needs to be doing. But the industry can't wait for us to keep talking. They actually need to see some shared partnership working in just getting things done. Where we have seen some things uh, done is around uh, two recent investments. So um, the investment in Ardisir, which we talk about extensively, I know, but is about the infrastructure. It's about upgrading uh, those facilities there, which does create opportunity for other developers to come in. And that was obviously joint UK government, Scottish government funding. The other one is the UK Investment Bank investment in Hunterston, in um, XLCC, uh, um, which complements some uh, funding that the Scottish Government has committed as well. Uh, and that is two examples of, you know, you can point to that and see active investment in infrastructure. So, so earlier on, um, you talked of the importance of the supply chain. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of the oil and gas supply chain, um, the knowledge <coughs> is immense. Uh, and people uh, within that supply chain uh, recognise that there needs to be change uh, and that they will uh, have to transition. Um, but they see things as it, as it currently stands as being difficult because there is not um, uh, the, uh, the comfort that they need um, uh, in terms of some of the regulatory changes that are required, which we've touched upon there. How can we get the UK government to work with us and to listen to industry to ensure um, that we secure those jobs for the future and we don't end up in a situation where we have jobs drying up and people going elsewhere when we will actually need them uh, to move forward uh, with uh, that green economy yeah. that we want to see. Well, the message I've been sharing is that if the UK government wants to achieve its aims around energy, then let us take the lead in Scotland. We, jointly with industry, can give a very clear steer on the changes that we need to see in very short order. And if those can just start to be made, so I think the UK government has had a big focus in the early weeks and months on getting GB energy set up and so on. But actually, when it comes to those questions, we, we know what needs to be done. So you could almost, you know, it's a, it's a clear list. And actually, it's just about making the changes uh, and also speaking with one voice. 
uh, to give reassurance to those that are minded to invest and are looking at what the what, what, whether they should stay here or go to some of our European neighbours. Because a lot of the investors that are, you know, international investors that are um, are coming to Scotland will then go on to maybe some of the Scandinavian countries, other European countries. So they, they, they have options. So we need to, um, to ensure that they're here. I realise I've been talking at length about investment and Richard is leading a lot of the work on attracting investment. Is there anything... But, because I think, uh, you know, inward investment is important, absolutely. Um, but we already have companies here, uh, companies with a huge amount of knowledge, uh, companies who are developing uh, new products to make the change. Um, in terms of that investment, are we ensuring that we are backing them to the hilt as well as relying on on inward investment. If Richard maybe wants to pick up on that as well, I'd be grateful. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's not a choice of either or in this. Um, so we perform really well on inward investment, ninth year in a row as the best place in the UK out of London, outside London and the South East. Um, but also, and I think you heard some of this from evidence from Adrian Gillespie, you know, Scottish Enterprise, the other enterprise agencies, they're supporting domestic companies to innovate to export, uh, wearing my tr the trade bit of my trade and investment hat. I think we've supported something like 100 trade missions over the last few years. Most of those are supporting domestic Scottish companies uh, to export overseas and increase their international sales. Uh, and that's grand, yeah. uh, and I think that's a very good thing. But it's not just the exporting overseas um, of uh, knowledge. It's also the possibility of manufacturing new products, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which I think is extremely important in terms uh, of our green industrial future. Uh, and I, I would be very grateful um, as we move forward if the committee could be updated and how we're dealing with that investment, that domestic investment, and in ensuring uh, that we make the uh, very most of the knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and the products that people are coming up with here. Yeah, thank you very much. I I I, I agree. You know, we um, your point there just about the supply chain. Uh, a lot of this is 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 just there's a sequence here to to this. So from the supply chain, we need to get some of the uh, major developments, particularly offshore. We need to get them through uh, consenting. We need to get them through planning. We need to get them uh, into a phase where they're about to build. Uh, they've pledged funding, and at that point, obviously in advance of that point, they will be looking to the Scottish domestic supply chain. And it will be those uh, services and products that are most, of, most at an advanced stage that will be able to then support uh, the, the, the wind or the hydrogen uh, opportunities. If they don't exist, they will then look overseas. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you, uh, and uh, good morning again, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I note in the 2024-25 budget, there's, there's a significant increase in uh, uh, the digital budget, uh, some 38% some in, in real terms, which I think is very welcome. Um, I'm unashamedly going to ask questions around um, the potential um, outcome you see uh, in NHS. Uh, I think we are... I mean, the UK as a whole is behind the curve when it comes to digital infrastructure and uh, IT uh, adoption. Um, and I note that the last government um, looked at investing three and a half billion pounds specifically in this. So I wonder um, if I could ask um, what outcomes you expect to see uh, from this, as I say, significant increase in digital in, uh, digital investment uh, yeah. in, pertaining to the NHS. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. So, you know, I would draw a distinction between the funding that is spent on digital infrastructure and the funding that is spent on technological advancement or digital innovation. So we obviously are spending quite considerable uh, sums of money right now on the Reaching 100 programme, mm -hmm. uh, where we are expecting the R100 contracts to connect over uh, one and, uh, 112,000 premises across Scotland uh, before 2028. But the bit I'm probably more interested in, I think you're more interested in, is the innovation, mm. if I'm reading you yep. correctly. Yeah. So 
There has been a huge amount of work, and I see it as one of my priorities, uh, is to try and support innovation within the NHS. And it's something that Neil Gray and I am both uh, leading on. So um, within a matter of weeks of coming into government, we had uh, established a, a round table with uh, a lot of the NHS boards, the key people around procurement within the NHS boards, and some of the most exciting uh, uh, businesses working in life sciences, uh, supported by university research and development uh, centres and so on. And the issues that came through there was from a life sciences perspective saying, well, actually, our biggest challenge is access into the NHS. And the NHS saying, well, actually, our, our biggest uh, challenge is that we have to do things in a way that enjoys the public's support and confidence. So how we interact with research and development uh, needs to be done in a sensitive, careful way. But what's come from that, those conversations is some significant progress in innovation within the NHS. So I, I talked briefly about, about digital dermatology, which uh, has been you know, months in the making. Uh, it was launched uh, uh, this month and is due to be embedded in, I think, 90% of uh, Scotland uh, within the next few months. And that massively reduces uh, waiting times mm -hmm. for dermatology uh, appointments using technology. And the point about that story is, this is not me talking about something really exciting in the life sciences sector that's still years away from implementation that is being implemented. To my mind, is one of the most compelling answers to the challenges within our NHS. There's similar levels of uh, technological uh, uh, advancement going on in when it comes to cancer, when it comes to diabetes, mm -hmm. and we're at the stage of this being implemented or perhaps being implemented on one uh, health board with a view to it being rolled out across uh, health boards. And um, Mark Wogan is very much supporting uh, that work and the, bringing his style of, of thinking and work to the NHS work. No, thank you. I think it's an area that I have um, got real interest in because I'm not the area I come out of before I come in here. I think that, uh, as you say, Cabinet Secretary, if we have a basic platform that allows that kind of innovation and technology, it will tackle, uh, help to tackle you know, waiting lists and it will help to tackle staff shortages, general health and economic inactivity. So I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that that's the direction of travel that we're going in. If I can move on quickly, because I know we're short of time. Um, if I can move on quickly to, to Presby Airport, I think we were, uh, I think we discussed this the last time we were in here, um, Cabinet Secretary and the committee uh, went down to Presby Airport and uh, had uh, you know, a, a really good um, uh, visit down there. Um, if I could just tie off something that we, we talked about the last time, I think, you know, uh, in terms of bids um, to uh, to buy the, buy the airport, I think I mentioned then there was a, a, there was a concern around the then uh, or the previous chair fronting a bid uh, for the airport and putting that in front of the government while he was still the chair of the of, of, of the airport and there's obviously a, a conflict of interest which I think I think you acknowledged at the time. Can you can you give us an update on where we are with that? Yeah. Yeah um I I will um uh, give you an update on that. So just in terms of uh, background which might be helpful to remind the committee of um that expression of interest uh, linked to Forsyth Black um uh, led well he was former chairman of the board and um, he resigned from the board to ensure an independent and fair assessment and uh, stepped back from his duties immediately upon disclosing that he was linked to an expression of interest. Um, and the Scottish Government and Presswick Airport subsequently agreed that he would have to resign rather than being uh, temporarily uh, removed uh, from his post. He does not have inside knowledge of competing bids to purchase the airport, as no formal bids have been received. And it wouldn't, I don't feel, be appropriate for me to share further details, including the number or identity of any other organisations behind an expression of interest at this time, but that is not to say that we can't come back to Parliament when there is something to share to update you on in due course. Okay, okay. Well, can you maybe give us an indication of, sort of the timeline to complete due diligence and maybe announce whether the bid has been successful or not? I don't know if anybody else wants to respond uh, to that, but um, 
you know, it, it remains our intention to return the business to the private sector and we will update Parliament at the appropriate time if there is a proposal that's received that represents good value uh, for the taxpayer and continues to deliver benefits to Scotland and uh, the local economy in Ayrshire. I'm very conscious in these quite sensitive periods of not seeing anything that, that jeopardises um, either the commercial element of this or indeed overspeaks in a political context either. Likewise. So what was that? Likewise. Great. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. I have members who would wish a couple of supplementaries if there's time from the Cabinet yeah. Secretary. Uh, Michelle Thompson uh, to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, very quickly, Cabinet Secretary, I, I, I couldn't be doing my job properly if I didn't ask uh, a little question about the refinery in Grangemouth in my constituency. Uh, there's been a lot of talk thus far about opportunities going forward and the work around Project Willow and so on, but of course um, the Cabinet Secretary's interest is around the economy, given her role. And the, the, the report by Scottish Enterprise uh, noted that the, the refinery contributed for an estimated £403.6 million to the Scottish economy. PwC estimates that there's not 400 jobs that could go. It's actually related jobs of nearly... Uh, 3,000. Uh, and of course, the FM, the First Minister himself, stated that this will create a significant economic shock. So my question to the Cabinet Secretary is, are we still focusing enough on the economic loss and the economic shock? And is the balance skewed too far at this stage to what the future might bring? Uh, thanks. We are still examining all options to bring forward new projects and employment opportunities at Grangemouth entirely because of the economic impact that uh, Michelle Thompson has just outlined. And that's where the joint working between the governments to uh, look at viable options for the future of the site, including the feasibility of transforming it into a low carbon uh, fuels uh, hub it uh, brings in and so where you know I, I, where I would um, point to uh, in terms of trying to maintain the economic activity that goes on or actually almost uh, increase the economic activity that goes on at Grangemouth is to, to say that where those options uh, will achieve that aim I think both the Scottish Government and the UK Government is, is very much willing to support it, uh, along with, hopefully, um, uh, support from uh, Petri, Petro Ineos. Um, we want Grangemouth to retain its position as Scotland's foremost industrial um, uh, site uh, well into the next decade and beyond. And the UK Government has committed to explore uh, routes to supporting the next stages of all those options via uh, the National uh, Wealth Fund. So I appreciate that that doesn't give any substantive answers right now in terms of what happens next, but I absolutely share Michelle Thompson's view that we can't take an eye off the economic impact uh, around uh, labour and around the, um, uh, the, the support for our, our energy mix. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, it's just back to Presswick Airport, if I may take you down there, Cabinet Secretary. Um, as you know, the Scottish Government has been and still is a great supporter of, of the airport. Uh, I just wondered if, and we, we own the airport, I just wondered if the Government sees the passenger volumes going in and out of Presswick as something that there's room for improvement for. We're, we're so close to Glasgow, and the Pre Presswick named Glasgow Presswick Airport, which is a strange term these days, I think, to, to use. But uh, given its closeness, do you see that there could be an increase in passenger volumes coming through Presswick. When you compare it to Glasgow, it's a, there's about half a million going through Presswick and about seven million going through Glasgow. So with that kind of closeness geographically and the fact that we own the airport, does the government see that there's potential to improve passenger volumes coming through Presswick? Yeah. yeah I mean, I obviously keep a very close eye on uh, Presswick airport accounts. So most recent ones uh, published on 16th November 2023 show that the uh, airport continues in a positive direction, posting a profit in 22-23. Uh, and uh, 
the next year's accounts are due for publication in late autumn. I don't know if any of us know a specific date, but it's, it's late uh, autumn. Um, I suppose Glasgow Pre Preswick Airport uh, has developed as, uh, as a specialist airport uh, and it's carved out a, a niche in a very competitive uh, aviation market. So I actually don't think it should be uh, necessarily competing with uh, Glasgow. I think it should be uh, trying to continue uh, Carving out that that niche, and you know we would we would not intervene in, in commercial decisions that were taken by the airport uh, anyway. And I would want the uh, management team to consider all potential uh, business opportunities to maximise the use of the assets of the airport as they as they do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I just ask a final question around the Anna Stewart review, which was published just over a year ago? Um, well, recent figures have been quite positive in terms of women starting businesses. I think the recent figures were the same rate as pretty much the same rate as men starting businesses. That is only part of the story, and we know that women businesses don't have the same longevity or lifespan as uh, male-owned businesses, and also there are still persistent issues in trying to access finance, uh, which isn't the same barriers there for male-owned businesses. So I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary would say more about what support and how they tend to implement the Anna Stewart review and where it goes next. Yeah, I mean, Convener, you have um, gone through uh, the statistics, so I won't uh, repeat them, but the reason for the Pathways review in the first place was because of uh, the concerning uh, statistics. Uh, the other statistic I would use is that 2p in every pound of investment goes to female founders, which in itself is quite, uh, quite stark. So I suppose a lot of the statistics that you've just outlined almost come as no surprise if that is the if that is the state of the investment uh, going into um, uh, female founders. I remain extremely committed to uh, implementation of the recommendations of the Pathway, Pathways uh, report. Uh, we've had the Pathways Fund uh, this year, opened on 19th of July, with up to £1.1 million of funding available to widen access to entrepreneurship. Um, so that was uh, very successful. It closed on the 30th of August. It received 130 applications and currently officials are working to confirm grant awards. Um, just on the data point, I think a lot of this does come back to data, and we have taken uh, on board the action to improve the data collection. So that is a, a work in progress, working with delivery agencies and academic partners to improve our understanding, our monitoring, and our reporting of data rep related to participation in entrepreneurship. And I'm sure the committee will be very interested uh, when and if we have an update on uh, what we have done as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Now, at the start of the parliamentary session, there was a commitment to £50 million pounds for a women's business centre, and there was a change in policy yeah. towards pop-up centres, but in terms of the budget commitment, the fund you outlined, I think, was just under £2 million. Is the £50 million figure, is that no longer a commitment to women in business? Um, we, we certainly moved away from the women, uh, the business hub, uh, because of the reason that we wanted to integrate that more in the general ecosystem uh, rather than having one site. And that was based on feedback we had um, from uh, women uh, working in that uh, sector. Um, in terms of uh, budget decisions, uh, we will continue to invest as much as we can in overall uh, what we're doing mm -hmm. around digital and technology. And quite clearly, you know, there's been, uh, there's been a number of funds that have been announced uh, since uh, the the since 2021, um, and you know we will. There isn't sort of a 50 million pound pot waiting there to be drawn down from. Mm -hmm. uh, we are investing through every budget in uh, female uh, entrepreneurship. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for joining us this morning. That brings us to the end of the evidence session, and I suspend the meeting and move into private session. Thank you.